So let's look at Surah's the, the models. Actually, there's more than one version of this, a large one and a s small one. A small one was painted afterwards. Well, three, three models posing, or maybe it's one model posing, posing three times, you know, it's, uh, it, or rather in three stages of the process of modeling. Maybe she's undressing, ready to, to model, then she's modeling, then she's getting dressed again afterwards. It's like a sort of time-lapse photography, a multiple exposure photograph almost. Curious sort of um, similarity between the, the three models makes you think that they are one, one model. That's a slightly un uncanny feel as a result. Well, posing brings up the the subject of painting itself. You know, it's like a painting about how paintings are made. You know, it's a self, there's a degree of self-referentiality. It's a bit like that Cezanne painting of the still life with plaster casts, which is a painting about paintings and sculptures and paintings of sculptures and all that sort of thing. There's another way in which this work is self-referential about art because we see a detail of the very painting we've been looking at just before the break, the Sunday afternoon on the island of Le Grand Jatte. So it's situated in Seurat's own studio with that painting to be seen there, painting within a painting, art about art. And well, it's even more closely linked together because we see here in the studio a hat and a sun umbrella parasol which are exactly the ones that appear in the painting itself so that sort of retrospectively gives us a sense of this painting as being a very constructed artificially made one you know it's, it's made in a studio with props so, so somehow coming back to look at this afterwards we, we start to say yeah well this wasn't just something that was seen it was something that was made. The artificiality of art is foregrounded by taking us behind the scenes in this way. It's not the only sun umbrella, there are others lying, lying around. So, okay, the painting that she's posing for, in a sense, is this painting, but, uh, well, maybe, you know, Maybe there is another painting in which a nude will feature, you know, that isn't just about painting itself. That's sort of implied. I mean, another painting like this with a subject of its own. But in fact, this is the painting. There's a great deal of symmetry to it. The, the <coughs> standing nude, the, the, the only one that's facing in our direction, as opposed to the back view or the profile view is pretty much in the center of the painting, aligning with the, the lines of the corner of the room behind. Proportions seem very important in a Seurat painting. You almost want to take a, a ruler to them, measure, you know, how far down the painting are her hands or her neck. You know, uh, is, is that exactly the same as that? Let's let's find out. Again, we can we can look at some of the studies that were made in in, in relation to the work. And as with the previous cases, he, he's studying figures individually and then putting them together. It's a very cool presentation of the female nude, which is potentially a, a very hot, erotic sort of subject, but he's presenting it in a very 
cool way. A little bit like the style of Ang, the great 19th century neoclassicist artist. He also has a certain kind of coolness of approaching the nude in certain works. This was the first of his major pieces where he has applied his pointillist technique from scratch in producing the work. So yeah, here the the depth of the, the Sunday afternoon on the island of Grand is painted from scratch in the pointless technique, but in the original it isn't. I I sort of think of him as being quite an intellectual artist, but partly because of his scientific interest, but also I feel him sort of wanting to plan things out in advance. So I, I I'm sort of seeing him as deciding, well, now I'll apply my technique not to um, a landscape uh, setting, but to uh, the nude, the great subject of the motif of classical art. So it's all, almost sort of programmatic, sort of trying out different subjects. And then maybe in this work, La Parade, uh, I'll try it with a nighttime scene, you know, This is even more stylized than the Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte, La Parade. You can translate as the, the side show. It's a, some kind of little show given outside a venue for paid performance. A little free show to attract an audience. You see them in the foreground gathering. Uh, and you get a little taste of what you would uh, have if you paid your money and went inside. But as I say, very, very stylized. The frontality of all the figures is striking, and all the, all the back view, the profile views. Everyone is in one of those three situations. Again, you want to take your ruler to the painting. You know, is that distance the same as that distance? One feels it might be. Is this figure right in the middle of the painting? One feels one wants to. To, to measure what uh, is this interval compared to that interval? Would it be if we measured it? Would it would there be some <coughs> certain ratio between them? Lots of very prominent horizontals and verticals. We've seen that in earlier works, but now it's becoming almost grid-like, really, very uh, ordered environment of the. The, the image as a whole. The study for it. The study looks so avant-garde <laughs> compared to, to the to the final painting. But it doesn't have to make sense because it's not meant to be looked at. Or I see him saying, well, okay, now maybe I'll try my new technique with uh, a figure scene where there is movement, you know, see how I can uh, try it out on, on such a, a subject. So, la shahu, the can can. So a modern dance, very contemporary type of subject. We need to sort of recapture that sense of the contemporaneity of it all. Yeah, it'd be like a 1980s artist making a painting about disco dancing or something like that. You know, something that is of that time. popular culture, high art addressing popular culture. 
Well, the, the last work we're looking at, the, the sideshow, very much concerned with horizontals and verticals, very static structure. But here we have quite a few diagonals, so he's activating it in a, in a, in a stronger way. There's another theorist of art that perhaps is of interest here is uh, Humbert de Superville, D-E-S-U-P-E-R-V-I-L-L-E, -E -E, de Superville. Um, and he wrote about um, the m meaning or emotional con connotation of lines, expressive connotation of lines. And his theory was if lines are predominantly horizontal, that produces a restful feel. If lines are predominantly go going down from a vertical, that produces a sort of feeling of sadness. If they're springing upwards from a, from a vertical, for, from a horizontal, sorry, then that could be a feeling of gaiety, of happiness. Well, uh, certainly in this painting, we see lots of lines springing up from a horizontal like the epaulettes of the dancers or the, de you know, the decoration of their shoes and the moustache of this or the lips of, of these dancers. Everywhere you see this, even the, the tulip-like shapes of the lights in this venue that the, the the dancing is taking place. So a programmatic attempt to create a certain mood perhaps, or at least an experiment to see whether you could do so. Whether you agree that there is a, a creation of a, of a certain mood of gaiety. Because of the stylization of it, 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 it seems slightly, I don't know, slightly sort of caustic and um, ironic somehow. Uh, one could even say that with the stylization of the Sunday afternoon on the island of Pacanja, that also felt like <coughs> a slightly sort of ironic take on, on leisure. You know, the tails of the dancer's jacket also leap upwards creating the same motif. This is all something that will be taken further by abstract art, you know, the idea that just shapes and colours in themselves could convey feeling. Therefore, if you start to believe that, well maybe you don't need any kind of literal subject matter at all, you just need lines and forms. So in that sense the a space is being made in theory, for abstract art before abstract art itself comes into being. It's almost a kind of inevitable that it's going to come at a certain point when people start to believe that lines and colours can communicate in their own right. And there's a lot of interest in this trying to systematize the language of artistic communication, although inevitably I think it's a s sort of failed project. I mean, like you can say with color, what is the expressive meanings of color? You, can s you could say, mm, if, you, if you ask pe give people a sort of pair and you ask which is happier, you know, is, um, is yellow happier than dark blue, you know, a lot of people might say, oh yes, yellow, but if you ask people what colour is happiness, <laughs> you know, then uh, they would, you'd probably not get agreement about what colour they would come up with. There's cultural differences in the associations of colours. Oh, just to contrast Seurat with an artist of his own time who's also representing dance, Toulouse-Lautrec, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. Lautrec has got a more linear treatment of, uh, of a dancing figure.
that stiff and stylized feel. Of course, it's actually a very, very difficult thing to represent motion within the static world of a painting. How are you going to do it? It's that you're, you're coming up to the very limits of what the medium of painting can achieve. It's one of those places where realism breaks down in art. You see this with futurist painters in, in early 20th century Italy, often trying to represent motion, pushes them towards abstraction. There just isn't a way to do it in a perfect, realistic way. Even a Hollywood movie, which you know, is one of the genres where realism still is alive today in the arts, if you see a car wheel, you see the spokes of the wheel maybe going the opposite direction of the car or something like that as it slows down. Uh, you know, could, because even even the cam a film camera can't capture realism um, uh, realistically. Motion. Well, film itself is a kind of trick of representing motion by actually physically moving images past your eyes so fast that your eye can't notice that they're actually static images one after the other. It's just a little trick relying on the limits of your eye's perception. It doesn't actually solve the problem of representing motion. It's still static images, but uh, you move those static images as a way of cheating the eye. The circus. This is an unfinished work. Sura unluckily died very young in a flu epidemic. Here you can see how the, the well we've been noticing his, him painting the borders, but here there, there is a, a much m more prominently painted border. It's actually a painted frame in this case, a frame within a frame. It seems like mostly what he's achieved so far is to, to do the primary colors. Uh, so the fact that it's unfinished, it gives us a little uh, insight into his working method that he maybe adds the primary color first. There's a lot of blue, red, and yellow. There isn't much, much green yet. Uh, so maybe he would add the secondary colors se afterwards. Again, you have these sort of upward springing lines, like the hat of a clown, or the hands of the clown, the dress of the acrobat on the horse's back, from the somersaulting figure, the legs. So is that to create this sense of gaiety? Here's, by the way, Sura himself talking about um, how different kinds of colors and lines or shapes can create certain effects. He, he says, different harmonies can be combined produce serenity, gaiety, or sadness. By gaiety of tone is meant that warm tones dominate. By gaiety of line, ascending indications of direction. That's what I mean here, ascending indications of direction. Above the ho horizontal. By serenity, that there is equality between dark and light tones, between warmth and coolness and hues, horizontality in line. By sadness of tone is meant that dark tones dominate, by sadness of hue that cold hues dominate, and by sadness of line that the indications of, of directions run downwards. This means of expression is the optical mixture of tones, hues, and their reactions in accordance with perfectly fixed laws. So he's trying to sort of I mean, I, I don't know how scientifically he applies it, actually. I mean, he, I think in the end he's an artist, so he will adjust things in terms of what works as a painting. But uh, that's what he's saying he's doing, that he's applying 
these sort of scientific theories of expression, that there is a grammar of expression. So I think maybe there's a lot more white in this work than would, would there would be in the final work. And when you can see a lot of blue, I mean, uh, the other thing about it is working process, maybe not so visible from this projected image, but in front of the painting itself, you see he outlines everything in blue line first, draws out everything, and then fills in the, the, the dots. Something of his working method is revealed in this unfinished piece. Uh, maybe what he's trying to do here is experiment again with movement, but also with not just diagonal lines or horizontal lines, but even more complex lines. The space is fairly flattened out, isn't it? You know, there's a very two-dimensional quality of design. Although that, that, the actual uh, circus space itself, the seating was fairly um, uh, sort of steep like that. One other stylistic influence com that's coming in is from Cinema, uh, from, keep saying cinema, from uh, you know, from popular posters from the circus and so forth. Um, and there's a particularly one artist called Cheret that he seems to have been interested in. So high art being interested in graphic design. You see this also in the work of Toulouse Autrec, the the interest of an artist in post posters as a medium. Um, and, and he's producing work uh, himself in, in such a medium. A dialogue between high art and, and more popular art. So that's one kind of influence coming in. Well, the circus also interested uh, Dugan. Later we'll see the, the circus interesting Picasso as well. It's the same circus, the name uh, changes. It's called the Circus uh, Medrano, Cirque Medrano, uh, and, and uh, originally was called the Cirque Fernando. So this is Dugas, Miss Lala at the Cirque Fernando. Well, some example of his landscapes. I've been kind of focusing on Seurat's more major, time-consuming, multi-figured works, showing a sort of sequence of those through to the, the circus, which is the last of them, I would say, uh, unfinished at his death. But let's look at some of the smaller works he produced, landscapes. Um, <coughs> instead of figures which feature so prominently in those works. Here, figures are, are pretty much absent. Even the boat, presumably there are figures on the boat, but they're very hard to, to make out. It's mostly things rather than people that predominate. Here, horizontal lines are dominating in the landscape. Uh, so according to his theory and that of de Superville, uh, this is uh, a mood of restfulness that would be created. It's a dusk scene. That's another good example for looking at um, how he's interested in the, the use of a, a, a painted frame. You know, it's another one where the, the painted frame is really quite large. This is um, Le Croteau looking downstream. The previous one was the Gravelin Channel. that dark grand comp. This is a work you could compare to some motifs in Japanese prints. 
know, maybe the Japanese print influence is still alive in his case. The bridge at Cobb of Y. Again, all this network of horizontals and verticals. He's been very interested in that kind of grid-like interaction. The factory chimney belching smoke again. The modern city when so many of the Impressionists were escaping the modern city. Seurat is renewing an interest in it. The Eiffel Tower, well now it's an icon of, of France, but at that time it was something quite new. Here it's not even completed. Many people thought it was rather ugly at the time. So this is very much, you know, modern structure. We're at the cutting edge of new technology, new materials, engineering, replacing architecture or something like that. So I was very interested in all this. The suburbs. Again, factory chimney, the city as a site of production, not just as a site of consumption, of leisure. Modernity in all its complexity. The lost in-between spaces in a city. As development moves ahead so rapidly that, um, you know, some areas are, are kind of still left undeveloped. You see that. I mean, you could see that very easily in in, in uh, many Chinese cities. So sudden expansion. Oh, let's build a new ring road, and then we suddenly there's a whole bunch of new construction. And sometimes there, some farmers' fields have been left standing, and and construction has sort of moved past them, and later will come back to 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 fill them. It's all a commonplace of our modern life in a way, suburbia. Maybe less in a city like Hong Kong than many others, but you know, suburbia was created by the possibilities of the railway. You know, you can commute from a suburb into the city to work uh, by train. So uh, suddenly suburb suburbs could exist. young woman powdering herself. This is actually a portrait of his mistress, Madeleine Knobloch. Um, originally his own portrait was included in the little inset scene on the wall, but someone told him that it looked a bit silly, so he changed it and put flowers instead. Uh, it's, uh, again, a very cool representation of a, of a human figure. Right? So, especially one that he presumably would be rather close to himself. Even you could treat it as an image of vanity or something. There's a, there's a kind of outsider's gaze, almost looking, looking through a keyhole sort of gaze that you, we, we have. It's a private scene of her preparing herself to be in public. Again, you have these upward springing forms associated with gaiety, but is that indeed the predominant mood of the painting? There's some kind of almost comic uh, contrast between her bulk and the, the rather delicate little ta table she's sitting in front of and, and, and the mirror on it. I don't know if that's intended as, as comic, but it, it, it sort of feels that you want to read it that way, as somehow the one contrasts with the other. Just to compare to a similar scene by Degas, you know, the, the, a lot of these subjects are subjects that other Impressionists or post-Impressionist artists have treated, but just in their own very different way. You could easily do a a kind of contrast between how uh, Seurat and Degas have treated the theme of women, women uh, you know, washing and um, 
combing their hair and so forth. And just to finish a few examples of his drawings again, the very lovely drawings he produced, but in this case not drawings in preparation for finished paintings, but drawings that were finished works in their own right, standalone drawings. So it's, this one's a portrait, a portrait of the painter Armand Jean. Again, it's just using, oh, yeah, I'll compare it to um, the work of an artist sometimes thought of as a, a symbolist artist, Eugene Carrière. He often had this sort of monochrome style of painting. Uh, just to give you one example, almost at random, of his uh, works. Motherhood. I think there's some kind of dialogue going on between Surat and him. Even though the, the medium is different, this is an oil painting. And a, a landscape drawing. This is a Paris uh, street scene. Place de la Concorde is one of the sort of ceremonial spaces in the heart of Paris, but uh, because it's it's dusk and uh, there's snow on the ground. You don't really get much sense of what well, is a you know a big fountain, but it's just a silhouette really. It's more about mood than it is about description. Here you do get a sort of linearity. The the previous one is much less linear in that respect, but this has a slightly informal feel. Well, he's using the tip of the crayon as much as the side of the crayon. Creating a, a sense of, you know, the tracks through the fresh snow of the carriages and so forth. But forms are difficult to make out. Everything is sort of blurring into um, darkness. You can see uh, the gas light, but it hasn't been lit yet. There isn't light, but uh, we're just before the point where lights would, would come on, presumably. Just to look at one or two works by other artists influenced by Sura. This is Signac, the most important follower of Surat. And he played a very important role in trans uh, getting other artists interested in Surat's style. Surat himself was quite a private person, and as, a, as I say, he died quite young anyway. Uh, but Signac was a proselytizer. He wrote a book from Delacroix to Neo-Impressionism, sort of treating Surat's style as the kind of the culmination of modern arts development so he, he did a lot to popularize it. This is his early style, he's uh, pretty much a sort of impressionist here but um, before long he's the, the kind of number one follower of Surat. The dining room or breakfast. The style is so associated with Surat, this point in the style, that it's it's kind of difficult for other artists to take it up without submerging their own personality. You know, it's um, it's like you know, if I ask you all to dress in the same color that I'm dressing in when you're in my class or something like that, it would be a big sort of imposition on your your self-expression. But it's almost it's almost like that. Again, there's something slightly stylized about the treatment of bourgeois life. It's almost like as if he wants to say there's something stiff about this this world of uh, the bourgeoisie. Some sort of critique intended. Portrait of Felix Fénéon. Fénéon was an important art critic at the time, supported the, the work of Seurat. 
very stylized, abstracted background, decorative background. Matisse. Well, we're just about to start talking about Matisse, but uh, just to, to note that he was one of the most important artists who spent some time going through um, Surat's style. There's a lot of people who go through it, they, they don't end up actually using it for it in the way it's meant to be used, but they, they spend some time playing with it and they, they learn something from them from it. It has a kind of liberating effect on them. And maybe they misuse it, a creative misunderstanding or misuse, deliberate misuse of a style, turning something pseudo-scientific into a decorative mannerism. When well, that kind of question comes up with Seurat's idiom itself, you know, you, you can look at it at one sense as being a sort of almost scientific way of creating a sense of luminosity, greater luminosity but it becomes a stylistic mannerism. You're very much aware of it in its own right as a style. Is he a success because of his style or just despite his style almost? He, 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 just because he, in his hands he can do something with it. In other artists' hands can they do something? Another great artist who spent some time uh, with Seurat's neo-impressionist idiom is the Impressionist painter Pizarro. This is an example of his typical 1870s Impressionist work, but at a certain point Pizarro comes to feel unsatisfied with the spontaneity or informality of Impressionism. Uh, I, I, so one of my points is that most of the, the Impressionists go through a sort of crisis at the same time as post-Impressionism is developing and Pizarro is amongst them. Uh, around about 1883, he wrote to his son uh, Lucien, saying, who was also an artist, saying, I am much disturbed by my unpolished and rough execution. I should like to develop a smoother technique, which while retaining the old fierceness, would be rid of these jarring notes, which make it difficult to see my canvas clearly, except where the light falls from the front. Somehow the, the spontaneity of this method was unsatisfying to him by a certain point. So what happens is that he ends up doing this, taking on board Seurat's uh, style, a more methodical... The broken brushwork is already there in Impressionism, but and the interest in luminosity, but a more systematic touch. And also you see this greater interest in defining outlines, which also comes from from Surat. So he is, Pizarro defines the near impressionism as to seek a modern synthesis of methods based on science, that is, based on Monsieur Chevreul's theory of color and on the experiments of Maxwell and the measurements of Mr. Rood, to substitute optical mixture for mixture of pigments, in other words, the breaking up of tones into their constituents for optical mixture stirs up far more intense luminosities than mixtures of pigment does. So there, there he is sort of, sort of speaking the party line, if you like. But it only lasted for a while. By 1890, he'd given it up. He says, having found after many attempts that it was impossible to be true to my sensations and consequently render life and movement, impossible to be faithful to the effects so random and so admirable of nature, impossible to give an individual character to my drawing. I have to give it up. Well, just some longer term influence of Seurat on the work of Bridget Riley, the, one of the most important op artists of the 1960s. Um, yeah, it, she openly acknowledges uh, Seurat as someone who interests her. Our part is, is the same idea, that the work of art is completed in your eye rather than completed on the canvas. You should think about what you're doing in terms of how it's going to affect, um, how it's going to look to, uh, to the viewers in the viewer's eye. Uh, you can play with effects of vision. This is her cataract. 
cataract uh, number five. Of course, cataract has a double meaning. A cataract could be a flow of fast flow of water. It could also be something that uh, is wrong with your eye, a sort of eye disease that's preventing your vision. In her early work, she did some sort of work studies after Sura. So we just have time to set the scene with Matisse. It's an artist who will take us some time to to altogether cover. A very simple way of thinking about late 19th and early 20th century art to, to tell it as one story would be to say, oh, well, then um, there was, on the one hand, the artists interested in color, like Gauguin and Van Gogh, and they influence Matisse and the Fauves in the 20th century. And then there were the artists interested in form or composition structure, like Cezanne, and they influenced um, Cubism, Picasso, Braque, and so forth. But that's really already too simplified, because Matisse is also interested in Cezanne. He's also interested in structure. Actually, that's one of the things that distinguishes him from the other, most of the other Fauve artists. When the other Fauve artists discover Cézanne, it's a bit of a problem for them there. A lot of them, like Braque, basically gives up being a Fauvist once he's discovered Cézanne. Uh, so does Derain. So uh, Blamac is basically finished as a Fauve artist after uh, Cézanne comes along for him. Um, so. But for Matisse, he's already aware of Cezanne at an earlier age, and he's able to, and he's already concerned with structure as well, and he's able to absorb that influence and use it in a more positive way. Um, Matisse was born in 1869, lived through to 1954, fairly long life, I mean, but he was, he doesn't start his artistic career very rapidly. I mean, it takes him a while to, to find his own idiom. He's, he's still doing works that are, have a kind of student-like quality to him when he's well into his 30s. Um, he began painting in 1890 when he was recuperating from illness. He actually began by copying color prints, so color was important right at the beginning. Uh, gave up a potential career in law uh, for uh, a career in painting as his interest developed. He, he failed, in fact, to get into the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the, the, the great art school in Paris, uh, the School of Fine Arts, and entered instead the private studio of the painter Gustave Moreau, one of the most important French symbolist painters. That He was there for five years, uh, along with several other artists who became part of the Fauve group, Mangouin, Rouart, and later Marquet. Um, even after the death of, of, of uh, um, uh, of, of his teacher, of, of um, Gustave Moreau, he um, still carried on a kind of the life of a student. Uh, for some time further. So he needed a kind of long incubation period absorbing different sources before he really came to his own style. Um, this is a work he produced as a student in the, good, the, the, the studio of Gustav Moreau. That's a common thing to do if you couldn't get into the art school. You study privately with the teachers of that art school. They would make extra money by doing their, have, having their own uh, private uh, students. This is the kind of work Moreau himself did. He was 
really something of a colorist. So, you know, you can say that's an influence on Matisse. Um, his symbolist paintings, this is one of his Salome paintings, but uh, they're often very detailed, jewel encrusted, rich, rich quality to them. Um, there's a Gustave Moreau museum in Paris, which is actually in his house. And one of the lovely things there to see is all his watercolors, uh, which are very more avant-garde in a sense than, than, than his paintings. When you, his oil, finished oil paintings, exhibited oil paintings. When you study with an artist, maybe you get to know the full range of their, their work. Apparently he was a very good teacher. He didn't try to Im impose his own approach on his students. He didn't want them to come up as painters that were painting the same way as he was. So he could accept Matisse as becoming a different kind of artist. His own paintings are very rich, but he said to Matisse, oh, you will simplify painting. You know, he had an understanding of the difference there. This is Matisse discovering Impressionism. The dinner table of eight, not 1897. Well, you see the Impressionist interest in light effects. It's a figure painting in one sense, but it's also almost a still life painting. There's very great interest in the still life detail. He liked to go to the Louvre and make copies of Chardin still lives or Dehim still lives, Dutch 17th century still lives or 18th century French still, uh, still lives. Those were important sources for him. So he's studying in from old master painting in the Louvre making copies as many artists. Even today you can see artists in the Louvre making copies but uh, that was an important part of studying. So yeah, lovely effects of life, it, it light, if you want to compare it to even one year earlier, uh, this work, the Breton Servant Girl, 1896, a very similar subject, uh, but so much more light filled than, than this work. That's the discovery of Impressionism. Please remember this uh, strange object here. It's a a fruit bowl that's also a flower bowl, a flower vase, the two things joined in one. We'll see that coming back in a, a later painting. A little bit awkward, the space here, the, how the space around where the, the, the maid is standing. Moreau liked it, he said, oh, you know, you could hang your hat on the on a carafe or something something along those lines. He'd come across the impression as he'd, he'd been on a painting uh, tour in Brittany with a, a, a minor artist now more or less forgotten who had learned something about the impressionist style and he so he learned a bit through him that was in um, this in, in 96. He'd also had a chance to see the work of the Kyle Bott collection, a great collection of uh, Impressionist art that was put on display um, when it was donated to the nation in the Luxembourg Museum, put on display in the spring of 1897. So this is a big, that he says himself that's the first time he really saw Impressionist painting. So it's something coming new uh, at this time. Uh, his interest in light, but also an interest in color, a brighter palette. That's what Impressionism allows. You know, this subject actually itself is, is, is there's nothing new. The, the Impressionists themselves uh, also were interested in the, the bourgeois dinner table. This is Monet painting the same subject. And of course, we, we just saw Signac painting a similar scene. 
some of Monet's contemporaries like Bonnard and Viard also show interest in this sort of subject. And here is one of the copies of 17th century Dutch still life paintings that he made at that time, which is all relevant to understanding this work. I'm kind of rushing through some early examples, but uh, I think that, that that's probably enough for to, for today. So next uh, next week we'll we'll look at the development of Matisse's art through his phobias and after see the kind of the arc of his development. <coughs>